Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I'm David Taylor, the Executive Director of the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. And uh, again, welcome to our Media All-Star Luncheon, uh, the concluding event of the 2011 Pennsylvania Leadership Conference, uh, the largest PLC ever, over 725 activists and concerned Pennsylvanians present. So thank you very much for that. Uh, after our, uh, at, the, at the end of our, uh, our speakers here, uh, we're going to announce the results of the straw poll, so please stick around for that. Um, we, we've been so pleased with this large attendance to have so many uh, leaders, elected officials uh, with us. We were able to recognize, I think, almost absolutely everyone. Last evening, but there were uh, two friends that we missed. I want to uh, recognize them now. Um, uh, the congressional challenger from Pennsylvania 4, Keith Rothfuss, is here. So, Keith, thank you very much. And also, uh, my good friend, uh, Mark Scaringi, a candidate for the United States Senate from Pennsylvania. Mark. Well, first of all, um, I want to uh, introduce one of our media all-stars, Rose Tennant. Rose Tennant is co-host of America's Morning Show with Quinn and Rose, a syndicated conservative talk show heard on FM News Talk 104.7 and various affiliates across the U.S., including XM Satellite Radio, Channel 158. She is sassy and witty, bringing insight on issues regarding politics, faith, and family values. She is the first and only female fill-in host for The Sean Hannity Show and is a frequent guest on Hannity on the Fox News Channel. She's a national speaker, including a Washington, D.C. National Tea Party and D.C. Prayer Service a speaker, as well as other national and local tea parties and events. Ladies and gentlemen, Rose Tennant. What an impressive event, am I right? And I think that someone needs to say thank you to Loman Henry. Would you just stand up for a minute, please? Because you've done so much work. You're an awesome guy. Thank you. Poor Loman. Last night I kept asking him, tell me about the podium. Is it big? Is it tall? Is it wide? He said, what do you care? I said, well, when you're a woman and you know you have to hold your stomach in for whatever length of time, <laughs> you get nervous. And, and if it's a big podium, then you don't have to worry about those kind of things. So my question to you is, does this podium make my stomach look small? <laughs> That's it, thank you. <laughs> Which reminds me of a bumper sticker I just bought. It's a photograph of Obama, and underneath it, it reads, does this ass make my car look big? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in talk radio, so I have been a target of Media Matters for a long time. If you look me up, there's a whole bunch of things that look really horrible that I've said. It's weird how it looks in print, isn't it? Or when they just take one sentence out of an, an entire dialogue and, and, and conversation. But they also said, I'm sure you remember this, David Bronk, just about a week or two ago, said that, um, and he's from Media Matters, he said that their plan, their goal, is to launch a sabotage and destroy mission against Fox News. Did you hear that? So I'm thinking, well, what are they going to do? Now, I can tell you right now that rumor has it that they intend to make Glenn Beck cry, which is <laughs> like, like, like that's some big accomplishment. If Glenn Beck cried anymore, he could, well, he could be John Boehner. Right? <laughs> And how cute is Speaker John Boehner? Every time I see him, he's crying, which is so weird because every time I saw the former Speaker, Pelosi, I was crying. <laughs> Speaking of Nancy Pelosi and Fox News, I'm sure like all of you, we tuned in this morning to hear what happened last night in Washington. People are expressing the same basic aspirations. A voice in their government, an end to corruption, freedom from violence and fear, the chance to live in dignity and to make the most of their God-given talents. These goals, she said, are not easily achieved, but they are without question worth working together. Let me ask you something. 
Is it just me or does it sound like Hillary is organizing a Tea Party movement for the people of Libya? You know, then it got a little more confusing because she started saying that she didn't, they didn't want to impose their will on the Libyan people. And I'm thinking, okay, the imposing your will on the Wisconsin people and the people of Arizona, that you can do, right? Last week I spoke at an event with someone that I've always admired. He was a leader during his time in Washington. He's a former majority leader of, uh, majority leader of the Republican Party, Dick Armey. And when I saw him, it brought to mind a conversation that he and I had many, many years ago during the Clinton administration. When I used to think the Clintons were scary, now they look like Sesame Street compared to this administration. <laughs> but anyway, I asked him, how do you deal with the criticisms from the left and from the media? And he said, Rose, I have a job to do. And when it's done, I will have all of eternity to forget about it. And I thought, you know what, that is good advice for us because isn't that how we are looking at things right now? We know that we have a job to do. And there may be criticisms and it may be a difficult road ahead, but it's a job that we must do and we have all eternity to forget about how difficult it was. Am I right? What an amazing two years it's been. I have to tell you a story. In October of 2008, right before the presidential elections, I was at a roundtable event with Newt Gingrich. One of the men there at the roundtable asked Newt Gingrich a question. Now, this man was very concerned about an Obama administration and what it might mean to our freedoms. I was so interested to hear what Newt would have to say because we know, I mean, whether you like him as a presidential candidate or not, there are two things that you cannot deny. That he is a very brilliant mind, uh, political mind of our times. And secondly, he is a man who understands the value of a well thought out plan. So I was interested to hear his response to this gentleman. And it was interesting because even then, he suggested that what was gonna to need to be done if something like an Obama administration came to be was that people were going to need to organize on a grassroots level. They needed to get involved in every level of the political process. Does this sound familiar? Now being a type A personality, I thought, oh my gosh, this is a great plan. What do I need to do? I'll help get it organized, I'll help start it. And it turns out that no one needed my help. I could not have guessed what was about to happen. In February 2009 came Obama's inauguration and it took the people just two short months to realize that we were headed to hell in a handbasket and we were moving there fast. With this new administration came an undeniable realization that a government for the people and by the people was under siege. The inspiration behind the Tea Party was a determination by we the people to stand against what we saw as a hostile takeover of our liberties. Which we knew fundamentally would challenge and change our America. Very big government, massive spending, debilitating taxes, a very, very sick economy. A realization that our very foundation Liberty for all was being challenged. Honestly, you, the American people, offered the only acceptable response to that challenge. What you saw was an aggressive move by our government to lay hands on everything that we hold dear. The movement was a spontaneous reaction to that. There were no playbooks. There were no lists of information or this is how you have to talk. Like Schumer gets his talking points from the caucus, right? We'll talk about that in a little bit. No one told you what to say and no one told you what to do. You knew instinctively what it was that you needed to do in order to stop the madness. And you did it. I think that one of the most impressive things during my lifetime has got to be the Tea Party movement. Do you see that? Do you believe that? The latest Rasmussen report came out, I think just two days ago, and it found that 48% of likely US voters say when it comes to the major issues facing America today, their views 
are closer to the Tea Party movement views than they are to the average member of Congress. And let me tell you something, that hasn't changed at all because a, a survey was done exactly a year ago on the same subject and about the same numbers showed up in the report. 78% of Republicans, 54% of voters not affiliated with either major party say the movement is good for the country. The media wouldn't have you believe that. I just saw a headline the other day. Is the Tea Party movement running out of steam? Do you think it's running out of steam? No. no. We've only just begun to fight. They haven't seen anything yet, have they? So many people find it difficult to explain the success of the Tea Party movement. Heck, they can't even understand it. Two weeks ago, Schumer, as I was just saying, got on a conference call, not realizing that reporters were already on the conference call, listening in. Schumer thought that he was on a private line with four Democratic senators, and he instructed the, the uh, senators to tell the reporters that the GOP is refusing to negotiate. He told the group that he likes to use the word extreme, and that's what the caucus, he said, told him to use. They can't even begin to explain you. Extreme, that's the best or the worst word they have for you? You want to stop out-of-control spending and you're extreme? As you probably heard by now, a government shutdown was avoided when a budget agreement was reached around 10.30 last night. Republicans agreed to a $38.5 billion cut to the 2011 budget. And this is a short-term measure until Friday. And there's still some hurdles. The bill needs to be drafted, and there's the three-day rule. But it's so funny, though, isn't it? Did you, did you read some of the stories? Everybody's taking credit for this. Obama's taking credit for it. Reid is taking credit for it. I think Charlie Sheen said something about him being responsible for it. It may not be everything that you were looking for, but let me tell you something. I read in the Wall Street Journal last week the fact that Congress is cutting any spending from the $3.6 trillion budget is a big cultural shift in Washington and an important course direction. This is, this is historical. Do you feel that? Yes. That is your handiwork. That is the handiwork of you and your efforts. That is amazing. You've changed history. Nothing like this has ever happened before. They have no idea how to explain you or the movement. Glenn Harlan, writing for the DC Examiner a while back, said this, over the next couple of years, these multitudes of virgin political operatives are going to acquire considerably more experience and self-assurance, which means they're probably going to become considerably more effective as well. Politics, he said, may not be the same when they're done. Politics are already not the same. You've changed everything. Glenn Reynolds writing in the New York Post said this about you. You demonstrate a kind of energy that our politics hasn't seen lately. I want you to know the Schumers of this world, they've never seen that kind of energy. They are afraid of that kind of energy. You know they're afraid of you, don't you? He knows that politics is no longer the same because of you, and they don't know what the heck they're going to do about it. A lot of people on the left and those in the mainstream media want to ignore or dismiss your efforts and, by the way, your successes. The movement scares them because you know what? It's about something that's bigger than they are. It's about ideas, ideas that have endured for centuries, ideas that founded this great country, the idea of freedom for all, the idea of limited government, the idea of a constitution by the people and for the people. That is big, and it's bigger than they. The Tea Party movement understands the need to return to the constitution and to hold our representatives' feet to the fire. They are in Washington for one purpose and one purpose only, to represent us. Madison once said, in a democracy, people meet and exercise the government in person. In a republic, they assemble and administer it by their representatives and agents. 
As a republic, we the people elect representatives who are responsible to us. We the people. When Benjamin Franklin left Independence Hall, when the Constitutional Convention had come to an end that final day of deliberation in 1787, a woman stopped him to ask, well, doctor, what have we got? A republic or a monarchy? And he replied, a republic if you can keep it. And that is the question today, is it not? We still have a republic. Can we keep it? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. <laughs> you all have fought the good fight, but we have to remain ever vigilant because there is still so much more work for us to do. If we don't do it now, then when do we do it? And do we do it for ourselves? We do it for generations of people that we will never know, just like it was done for us. We know what we have to do because it is within the very fiber of who we are. We know this instinctively. We don't do it for ourselves. Scott Rasmussen reported in his last book that the gap between Americans who want to govern themselves and those politicians who want to rule over them may be as big today as the gap between the colonies in England in the 18th century. We are living in amazing times. Can you feel it? It's no coincidence that you are here for such a time as this. You have a job to do. And I am confident that you will continue the work that you've begun. You are the true patriots. We have a calling and we are the key to restoring this great nation. I'd like to leave you with this quote from President Ronald Reagan. Let us be sure that those who come after us will say of us that in our time, we did everything that could be done. We finished the race, we kept them free, and we kept the faith. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Rose. And um, now we are at the other, bringing, bringing on the other prominent media presence to be with us today, the one and only John Fund. John Fund is a columnist for the Wall Street Journal and writes on the trail for the journal's website. He's also a commentator on the 24-hour cable news channel, Fox News. Mr. Fund previously served as Deputy Editorial Features Editor and on the Journal's editorial board. His editorials on congressional reform led the Capitol Hill newspaper roll call to dub him, quote, the Tom Paine of the modern congressional reform movement, unquote. And his articles on education reform have been honored with awards from the American Legislative Exchange Council and the Institute for Justice. Mr. Fund served as an analyst for the California State Legislature before beginning his journalism career as a reporter with syndicated columnists Roland Evans and Robert Novak. He is the author of several books, the most recent being Stealing Elections, How Voter Fraud Threatens Our Democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, John Fund. And actually, at the conclusion of uh, his remarks, that uh, Mr. Fund is going to be out in the lobby at the registration desk uh, for book signing. So you can see him there in person. And now, John Fund. Thank you. Well, I am humbled and honored to be here. Humbled because you've heard from a lot of wonderful speakers, including Rose. And some would say, I don't have much more to say. But I do. Because this is my third time here at the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference. And I just want to commend Loman Henry and David and all of the people, the staff who helped make this possible. I attend a lot of these gatherings. I think this is the most impressive single state conservative leadership conference I go to. And you are to be commended for that. And let me tell you what's different this time than the two previous occasions I've been here. 
first, there's more of you. And secondly, the reason there's more of you. The biggest single change in American politics the last couple of years has been this. All over this country, all over this commonwealth, ordinary people who normally lead very busy lives and they, most of them want to forget about politics and get on with the serious business of living, which is their job, their family, their faith, their hobbies, all of the things that make life meaningful. They've woken up and realized we are not going to deliver the America our founding fathers bequeathed to us, to our children, grandchildren, unless we get involved. You know, there was a famous saying once that war is too important to be left to the generals because real people die in wars. Well, you have all decided that despite everything you used to be told by your local committeemen and your local party operatives, you have decided on your own that the challenges this country and this commonwealth face are such that politics is now too important to be left just to the politicians. You have to get involved. And boy, have you gotten involved. They noticed last November. And they will notice even more November of next year. By the way, how many of you here in the room are readers or subscribers to the Wall Street Journal? Raise your hands. How many of you are viewers of Fox News? You know, between those two questions, I think we've covered the whole room. Which, so the least I can do is come and thank you for helping to pay my salary, which you do. Thank you, and I'm going to pay it back now with making three quick points. The first is, I know you've heard a lot of discussion about the 2012 presidential race. Uh, I'm going to briefly discuss that without mentioning a candidate. Believe it, I can do it. Two, I'm going to discuss the place I just flew in from this morning. It's a place called Wisconsin. And I'll give you an update on that. And three, how does Wisconsin relate to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? So let's get going. First of all, Barack Obama is running scared. He may not always act like it, but he is. The budget showdown we just went through, which ended at midnight last night, the final issue on the table wasn't a number. It was about inner city kids. The DC school scholarship program that had sent thousands and thousands of kids to local charter schools and parochial schools and private schools in Washington, D.C. to escape a system where only 10% of the students in many high schools could read at even an eighth grade level. That program was snuffed out and killed in 2009 by the Democratic Congress with Barack Obama going along with it. Well, John Boehner, the Speaker of the House, brought that bill to the floor a couple weeks ago and said, we are going to pass this, we are going to restore the hope and opportunity these kids in Washington, D.C. have lost. That issue was on the table. Barack Obama said he strongly opposed the program, he threatened to veto. But when push came to shove, Barack Obama realized something. Who has been the product of private schools his entire life? because of scholarships given by people who cared. Barack Obama. Who, other than, remember, Jimmy Carter, who opposed school choice, had the courage to send Amy to the DC public schools, and I give him credit for that. Barack Obama sent his children to Sidwell Friends, where the tuition is $35,000 a year. And by the way, Sidwell Friends was part of the DC scholarship program and guess what? They were kids who went with Sasha and Malia to Sidwell Friends who had to leave because Barack Obama allowed that scholarship program to be killed. This is beyond limousine liberalism. This is limousine liberal riding on a gas tank of hypocrisy. Barack Obama blinked. The DC School Voucher Program is back in business. Now, the 2012 presidential race. Each political party has its own cultural characteristics. 
The Democratic Party and the Republican Party nominate presidential contenders with completely different models, completely different habits. The Democrats operate on the blind date theory of picking presidential candidates. <laughs> Their theory is, if you go on enough blind dates, you'll fall in love, and that will be the one, the one, who will offer hope and change, hope and change. And if you don't believe me, let's go back through history. All those blind dates the Democrats went with on a spin around the presidential primary system didn't ask enough questions and woke up one morning and suddenly they were nominated to them. <laughs> Let's see, George McGovern, 1972, that worked out really well, he won one state. Jimmy Carter did get elected, but he was Jimmy Carter. <laughs> Gary Hart didn't get nominated, because there was some monkey business before the convention. <laughs> Bill Clinton, now there was a surprise blind date. I'm always full of surprises. <laughs> now he did get elected, but he had all kinds of surprises that he brought with him. He, had, he brought his own blind dates with him. <laughs> John Kerry, a windsurfing liberal from Massachusetts, bad blind date. And then there was the guy who really was the mystery candidate, Barack Obama, who had barely after getting elected to the Senate, he was running for president, had no legislative record to speak of. His most important job that we could ever figure out, if we looked carefully enough, was that he was a lawyer for ACORN. That group has fallen on hard times. <laughs> so the Democrats have this blind date theory of history. And when they win, we get all kinds of surprises as a country. The Republicans have the next guy or gal in line theory of, history, of nominating candidates. If you don't believe me, let's go back. Let's see. Um, they always like to nominate the person who ran the last time but came in second. 1988, Ronald Reagan is retiring. Well, who ran against Reagan in the primaries in 80 and became his vice president? George H.W. Bush. Let's nominate George H.W. Bush. 1996, got to nominate a candidate against Bill Clinton. Well, who ran against George H.W. Bush in 88 and came in second? Why, it was none other than Bob, I'm sorry, Bob Dole. <laughs> Let's nominate him, he's 73 years old, but he's tanned, rested, and ready. <laughs> 2000, who are we gonna nominate? We don't have an obvious front runner. Well, let's nominate the son of the last president we had. 2008, George W. Bush is retiring. Well, who was the candidate who ran second to him in the 2000 primaries? John McCain, let's nominate him. Do you detect a pattern here? In fact, this pattern is so ingrained in Republican presidential politics, I'm gonna tell you something you won't believe, but it's true. Between 1948 and 2008 is 60 years, three generations. Between those two elections, in every presidential election but one, the Republican presidential ticket nominated for either president or vice president in every one but one, a Nixon, a Bush, or a Dole. Do the math. The only exception being Goldwater Miller, 1964. Every other election in a Nixon, a Bush, or a Dole, number one or number two spot in the ticket. I call that too much time in the same end of the gene pool. Now, there, there are future exceptions. There are future exceptions. There is the white sheep of the Bush family, Jeb. The white sheep. But seriously, it's time to recognize the best news of 2012 yet. For the first time in modern presidential politics, the Republican Party does not have an obvious, clear front runner. This is a good thing. You know, conservatives believe in competition in everything from baseball to business. But for too long, they have gone along with the establishment players who told them, sit down, shut up, and take the next guy or gal in line. We're over with that. So you may look at the field of candidates and be disappointed. Well, there are going to be candidates you haven't heard of before coming. But in addition, there are a lot of solid candidates here. We have a competitive process. They're going to run around the country giving speeches. I've already seen the candidates improve dramatically. 
just in the last few weeks and months watching them give their stump speech. Celebrate a competitive process because out of that competition, whoever is nominated is going to be a battle-tested, battle-ready candidate. This is a good thing you're having a competitive contest. You believe in competition and everything else in life, trust the American people that this competitive process will bring out forth a good candidate. Now, I'll make one exception to my rule of not mentioning a name. Because I said I would not mention the name of any potential Republican presidential candidate. So I'm free to mention this name. The Bible warns us of false prophets. And I'm here to warn you of one. Someone who I've known for over 20 years, and I personally like, but candor and truth compel me to tell you, please, just because he's on TV, no Donald Trump. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. If you ever meet Donald Trump, ask him the following three questions. Mr. Trump, why is there no political party in this country that you haven't been registered in? <laughs> Second question, why were you a registered Democrat until 2009? You can look it up. Why? And this was for almost a decade. Third question, your campaign contributions. All right, maybe a few years ago when you were a Democrat, you could explain why you were a leading contributor to Harry Reid and Chuck Schumer and John Kerry. Please explain why three months ago you gave $50,000 to Rahm Emanuel's campaign for mayor of Chicago. Please explain that. And when you can bring me back the answer to those three questions, I will be happy to include him if I'm satisfied with the answers in the ranks of potential Republican candidates. Until then, I say permanent probation. And I'll tell you something about Donald Trump on the issues. You could walk through his deepest consistency and not get your ankles wet. <laughs> now, having disposed, I'm sorry, discussed that, <laughs> Wisconsin. We had lunch with Governor Chris Christie of New Jersey the other day. <laughs> and he put, he put Wisconsin into perspective. He said, the two things the left always talks about our, we're doing it for the children, and we're doing it for the workers. Well, Wisconsin puts the lie to that, and so does New Jersey. As Chris Christie pointed out, there are about 65 union officials in New Jersey who earn more than his salary as governor. The head of the New Jersey Education Association earns $585,000, plus overtime, plus bonuses, plus a union car. That's just the tip of the iceberg. When the, when the New Jersey Education Association, Governor Christie told us, says it's for the children, you always say it's accurate, except you substitute one word. It's for the adults. It's always for the adults. That happens everywhere. In this state of Pennsylvania, you have 97,000 people who attend all the campuses of Penn State. There are 48,000 employees. It's for the adults. It's for the adults. Here's what the deal is in Wisconsin. Governor Walker came to the unions and said, here's the deal, we're bankrupt. We are going to ask you to make a modest contribution to your health and pension benefits. You will still be way below the national average for state and municipal workers, and you will be way, way below the average for private sector workers. And they and we're also going to change the rules on union power and union elections and union dues. Well, he announced his proposal and they immediately started coming out in force. And he said, no, we're serious. We're going to put a vote to this. The unions came to him and said, all right, all right. We'll, we'll, we'll go find the, find the health and benefit. No, no problem. Just get rid of the rest of it. He said they couldn't wait to throw their members under the bus. They couldn't wait. Because here's what the real issue is. The real issue here is, as you know, in any murder mystery or any financial scandal, follow the money. The money is this bizarre situation we have in this country where 
We have lots of politically powerful organizations in this country. AARP is a perfect example, 55 million members. But the money they collect is voluntary. They're still a powerful political force. The unions are the only group of people in this country who can get the government at the state and local level to be their collection agent for union dues that get funneled right back into their coffers without even a wire transfer fee. They literally don't even have to pay a fee on the transfer. And then they can plow that money into politics and elect people who will represent the other side of the negotiating table. So you have this spectacle in New Jersey of Governor John Corzine standing at the State House in Trenton and yelling out at the union members of the SEIU saying, we are going to fight for your contract. We will get you a fair contract. Who's we? He was management. That's just the spectacle we have. The unions get to elect both sides of the bargaining table. That's why we're in the budget mess we're in in large part. And in Wisconsin, the unions were willing to make every concession except what, what Governor Walker wanted to do is say, you're gonna be like every other private entity in this country. You want, you want money from your members? Go ask them. That's very simple. It's called freedom. Freedom of choice. And instead, they sicked 70,000 people, many of them bust from out of state, bust from all over the country. They upended the state. 14 Democratic state senators left the state, went to Rockford, Illinois, Believe me, things have to be desperate if you go to Rockford, Illinois. <laughs> and several of the Democratic senators actually wanted to come back. I talked to one of them. One of them said, I'd like to come back, but they won't let me. Now, he never told me who they was, but I think they were the union label. So we now have this turmoil in Wisconsin, and it's all about the dues money. Well, let me tell you why this is so important. We have a couple of honest people in the union movement who have told us what the real issue here is. Robert Chanin was the general counsel of the National Education Association until 2009. He said in U.S. District Court, this is a document, in U.S. District Court, you cannot take away the mechanism of payroll deduction because if you do, you will not collect a penny from these people. I think it has to do with the nature of the beast in our movement and the beasts who are our teachers. This is, the, this is the general lawyer of the National Education Association calling his own members beasts. They simply don't want to come up with the money regardless of the purpose. Robert Reich, who was Bill Clinton's labor secretary, said, we have to have forced collection of union dues by the government because unions have to lash their members to the mast in order to get anything done. Well, the problem is the ship of state is sinking. And we need to, we need to release them from the, from the lashes of the mast in order to keep the ship afloat. Look, we have four examples recently of where union dues were made voluntary, either for all dues or just for those portion that go to politics. Washington State, very liberal state, when the teachers lost the power to collect union dues from their members, the number of teachers who stopped contributing to the union's political funds fell by 90%. 90%. Utah, when Utah ended compulsory union dues, 95% stopped paying. Now, New York, we had a transit strike a few years ago. Transit workers union walked out illegally. Punishment, lost their union dues. Now, this union is tough. It's actually run by a communist. I mean, a serious communist, capital C. Picture Marx and Engels on the wall. Their union dues fell by 50%, but they're the most hardcore union I've ever seen. Indiana, Governor Mitch Daniels ended collective bargaining, power of collection union dues in 2005 by executive order. He had the power to do that. To this day, 95% of state employees in Indiana no longer pay dues. That's what this battle is all about. And, that comes to the next point about all of the states that are waking up and realizing we have to side with the taxpayer because for too long we have allowed our elected leaders to lead a quiet life and the price of their quiet life is the fiscal solvency and the future of our country. We can no longer afford it. We no longer have the power to lead a quiet life. 
or the ability. We have to change. You know what Churchill said, government will always, always do the right thing, but first it must exhaust all their possibilities. <laughs> We're here, which is why I'm so pleased to see Ohio and Florida and Indiana and Wisconsin, state after state, Republican governors and a Republican legislature taking the tough choices, making the tough decisions. But where is Pennsylvania? Look, I know there are people in this state who want a quiet life, politically. I know that there are people in this state who have gone along to get along for a long time. And they hope that this can continue. Well, it can't. Because I will tell you right now, I can give you a living example just across the river in New Jersey of what happens when Republicans win a governorship and overwhelming majorities in the legislature and then squander it. 1993, after Jim Florio, Christy Whitten was elected governor, the Republican majorities in the New Jersey legislature were two to one. They did nothing with them. They did cut taxes, which was Christy Whitman's promise. But in terms of initiative and referendum, in terms of political reform, in terms of pension reform, no, they didn't, they didn't stop up the holes in the pension program. They opened them. It was a bipartisan scandal in New Jersey. And what happened? Eventually, they got tossed completely out of office. And if John Corzine had not been as bad a governor, had not been perhaps the, the worst governor since, no, not that bad. <laughs> if he had not been the worst governor since Rod Blagojevich, <laughs> and then brought in Chris Christie, you would still see a Republican Party in New Jersey that was shattered and broken and not trusted by any voters. If you let this opportunity go to waste, your future is New Jersey, the old New Jersey, the New Jersey of compromise and surrender to the real political power in this state, which is what I call the fourth party, the SEIU. There's the Democratic Party, there's the Republican Party, there's now the Tea Party, but your challenge is to take on the fourth party, which is the union label. Now, one other point about Wisconsin. There's been some allegations that they were hanky-panky in Wisconsin. There certainly have been strange things happening. Um, the votes that were just found are legal. Even the Democratic canvassing chairman agrees. But it certainly is disturbing that, uh, you know, in these election systems, we sometimes can't tell where the incompetence ends and the fraud begins. Well, I can tell you, there's a lot of incompetence in Pennsylvania election offices. But I know in the city of Philadelphia there's something strange going on. For, for 20 years, there have been more registered voters in the city of Philadelphia than they've been adults over the age of 18, as counted by the census. This is a recipe for problems. I think it's very important that Governor Corbett appoint someone to the Bureau of Elections who actually has a law enforcement background who can get to the bottom of this and propose legislation that will change this. And I'm serious, make this a priority. And if you don't want to make this a priority, let me ask you one thing. Do you want to spend the rest of your life, every two, first Tuesday in November, staying up late at night and asking yourself one question? How many votes are going to come out of Philadelphia and where are they coming from? Do you want to spend the rest of your life wondering about that? I don't think so. The time to change the election laws of Pennsylvania and bring them into the 21st century is now. And there are three parts to that change. One, photo ID. You can't do anything in this. We have had photo ID, tough photo ID laws in Indiana and Georgia. Voter turnout has gone up. There is not a single known example of someone who's been turned away because of a lack of a photo ID who ultimately did not get to vote if they wanted to. Secondly, we ask for photo ID in every aspect of our life. If there are people out there who don't have photo ID, they are marginalizing themselves from the rest of society. They can't fully participate in our life. I say we are doing them a favor by seeking them out and giving them a free ID. This is helping them. You can't, you can't enter the mainstream of economic life in this country without photo ID. Let's make sure everyone has one so every one of us can participate in American life. This is doing them a favor. Secondly, absentee ballots. The, the, the point a photo ID will be lost because the fraudsters will just move to absentee ballots. Kansas has just passed a law. You can vote absentee, 
but you have to include the last four digits of your driver's license or state identification number on the absentee ballot. That would cut down a lot of the fraud. <laughs> Lastly, I believe that we need a cleanup, a full cleanup of the voter registration rolls in Pennsylvania. <laughs> Some progress has been made, but we need to find out that, you know, Aunt Sadie's cousin who died 30 years ago, you know, God bless her, but should she still be on the voting rolls of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia? I'll just wrap up with one thing. I know this is a lot of challenges. I know there are a lot of obstacles here, but you had much bigger challenges last year, and look what you accomplished. Pat Toomey, U.S. Senate. Tom Corbett, Governor. And a Republican legislature, although at least in one body, not a conservative legislature, you have challenges. But did you ever think two years ago you'd be handed this much treasure and this much opportunity? No. Don't let it go to waste. Force the issue, even if you have to be a pest. Because if you let this opportunity slip, it may not come back within your lifetime. Because voters looking at a political party that's been handed power and handed authority and handed a mandate, if they see that, go fallow. If they see no seeds planted in the ground that will grow, they will turn on you. And they should. And Ronald Reagan said it best, first cabinet meeting after he became president. They were discussing the tremendous changes they're going to have to make in the budget. And there were cabinet members who were grumbling. I don't really want to take these cuts. Oh, this will be awful. I need a quiet life. Well, Ronald Reagan ended the conversation with these words. He said, is there anyone here who does not think we are in crisis? Who, if we do not do something now, we will not be able to halt the managed decline of our country into mediocrity and economic stagnation and national and world impotence. Is there anyone here who does not think the crisis is big enough? No. Well then, if that's the case, someone has to deal with it. And if not us, who? And if not now, when? Thank you very much.